Is that it? You got away with it. <laughs> okay, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Sweet Jesus, we praise and we thank and we adore and we glorify you for all of the gifts that you have tucked into our hearts this last 24 hours, the gifts that we are aware of and the gifts that we have yet to see, but that we will come to know as the days here pass on and we look back and we see that you were really speaking to us. And we ask the Blessed Mother to be with us and to intercede for us because she is the perfection of all women. And she is our model. She is your masterpiece of womanhood, of femininity. And she wants to help guide us to be similar to her. And we want to praise and adore and glorify you, Lord, for all of your gifts in this world today that are bringing forth a new age of womanhood. So often the gifts of being a woman are persecuted or warped or changed. And you are fighting these things through raising up new female saints in the church that are so different from each other and yet all similar to Our Lady in one way or another. And we pray that prayer that Our Lady prayed with St. Elizabeth when she visited her the Magnificat will pray just the beginning. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly handmaiden. From henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For the Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Hail Mary full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come by the means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, thy well-beloved spouse. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I quickly ran up into my room before I came down here, I just asked the Lord, like, give me a prayer, give me something. And I heard that Magnificat, and I opened to the Magnificat. I was like, perfect, thanks. <laughs> so I thought, you know, that's going to be the, the springboard here. And, um, you know, it's perfect because... I'm going to go br just briefly through the different topics covered in my book. Normally when I give a retreat on this book, I give like a whole talk on each of the chapters. So I'm just going to kind of do a like synopsis. And if you want a little bit more, get the book. <laughs> so, and I have online some of those retreats that I've given for free that you could listen to. So um, you just have to go to the book page for this. And I have them in English, and then I have them in Polish. So um, you can get a little bit more that way. But at the beginning of this book, I talk about um, the mystery of womanhood and how women are a mystery. And um, there's something very hidden in the heart of a woman that is um, created by God. And... Each person, I mean, we talked about this in a myriad of ways. I mean, the priests talk about it, and you talked about it today, how, like, each woman is called to something different, right? And so none of us are going to be, like, cookie cutters of each other, and God doesn't want that. But the incredible mystery is that we all find our identity in Our Lady, and even if we're all looking at her and we're all trying to imitate her in one way or another— we're going to be different because God, when he makes us more and more ourselves, then we're unique, right? But we want to look at Our Lady. And if that's the last thing that I can give you as you leave from here is to really meditate on Our Lady. Take whatever image it is of Our Lady that's your favorite. And, you know, there's thousands and thousands of images in the church. But 
put her before you and, you know, ask yourself or ask the Holy Spirit to show you what is it that's so attractive to you in that image? Because that's probably what God is trying to uncover in your own soul, right? What is it that he's trying to grow and nurture and, um, and fix maybe if you're broken? Um, is it her great light in something? You know, maybe he's trying to give you that greater joy or freedom in something. Is it her docility? Maybe he's trying to, you know, repair, you know, some control or pride or hard heartedness or something, you know? Is it, what is it that is so attractive about her in whatever image comes to you? Because that's how God is going to help you to become holy. And, um, I like things to like all be really connected. <laughs> I just, I like to think that way where everything's kind of organized. And I always go back to like the beginning, right? Um, and so that's what I did in this book is I went back to Genesis, right? When you start thinking about what we are as women called to be, what was God's original plan for women? What are we you know, who are we created to be? What's our goal here? And it, there's two different creation stories. And I pulled something from each one of them. So the first chapter has to do with woman as gift. And you see in that first creation story how um, God created man and woman. And he created them equal, but he made them different. And I've got all sorts of really good quotes you can pull from in here to think about, you know, where the popes and the saints have talked about that, how we're complementary with men. So I'm not going to focus on it. But what is important to see in that first story is how we were created equal but different, right? And, um, you know, there's an illness in today's world about that. When I studied at Notre Dame, and all of my sisters up until me went to St. Mary's. Then my dad, like, put his foot down. <laughs> and it, we just, we really ran up against a lot of those negative, evil feminists. And at St. Notre Dame, I was greatly persecuted by them. And um, many times I would come back to my dorm in tears over the things that some of these um, women would say. Even sometimes they were like, sisters or, you know, like women professors and how they would mock our lady and her humility and how they had this warped view of feminism. It wasn't the holiness of womanhood. It was almost like this competition with men. And they didn't understand, well, they didn't understand our lady. They didn't understand the, these Genesis stories, like who God really made us to be. And so, that's kind of where the book came from because I took a private class with Ralph McInerney. He was a very well-known, um, he was in the philosophy department, but he's a theologian too. He's an expert on Vatican II. And he said for us at the end, well, it was supposed to be me and then all these people were like, you have a directed readings with Ralph McInerney? Can I come? And it, it turned into this huge class that we had. And um, at the end, he said, pick whatever topic it is that might like resonate most in your heart and write your 20 some page paper on it. And so mine was womanhood, right? What is the real call to women to be holy? And I went through a lot of the saints writings and Edith Stein and Pope John Paul II and kind of came up with this. And then later on, I was asked to teach retreats like in Siberia. So you've got like peasant uneducated people so I had to apply it to them, right? And then it was like here in the United States and then like in Poland. And so like I kind of, you know, it, it's not just a theology thing, but it, it made me reflect through all these different lenses, first through um, academia and then through, you know, peasant Russians, you know, and then through the American teenagers that I would talk to. And what is um, the Lord trying to speak to us through these stories of Genesis, right? And so the first is that men and women are created equal and different. Okay, so we're all equal and different. Number two, the second story um, has to do with, you know, Father talked about it a little bit last night, that original solitude where 
you know, man and woman, man was created and he was alone. And it, God said, it's not good that he be alone. And so he created a wife for him. He created Eve and he created her from him and for him. So the first thing that you see with women is that they were created as a gift. Woman was created to be like this great gift from God. And so I take you through in that first chapter the way that women are gifts. Now, you and I are not going to be the same in each, you know, characteristic because we're different. But in general, how did God make our bodies to be a gift? It's interesting. Um, I know several authors and like teachers and seminaries and stuff who've written on women's issues. And they all say their favorite section of this book is mine on woman as gift. And it's just interesting because um, I would have thought that they would be like way past this, you know. <laughs> But I take you through, like, how was a woman's body made to be a gift? Well, in today's world, you know, people want you to look completely like, I mean, it's irrational the way that you're expected, you know, especially young people are supposed to, like, you have no fat on your body and you know, you know, everything has to be this perfect idea of beauty. And like, that's not real beauty. And God made women to carry children. And if you don't have a certain amount of fat on your body, you can't conceive. I know several women that went through infertility until they could gain weight, right? So God made our bodies as a gift. And he made our bodies as a gift um, for humanity, for man. I mean, if you're married, it's in a very concrete way. If you're a mother, your body is a gift to your children. Very concretely, it's their first home. And, you know, think about the ways that you serve them once they're born. I mean, you, you feed them. You know what I mean? Um, like everything for them comes forth from you. But it's not just a call to a married woman with, you know, a bunch of kids. Look at me, somebody who just gave her whole life to the Lord. And I serve God through my body as a gift but it's in right now it's through speaking you know he he doesn't relay my thoughts to you without me moving my mouth and and using it and my hands that took care of the orphans and you know gave them concrete food and you know there's all sorts of ways you can come up and think about it but god created you to be a gift in your body and um it's, it's just beautiful to reflect on that. And then your mind. And, you know, Pope John Paul II used to always say that you, he was very much for the development of women, even if you're just at home with a bunch of kids. Like, you have to have a gift to be a gift. So my sisters with great educations that then stayed home and homeschooled their kids, people would say, what a waste. Well, no. They had really smart kids, you know, and um, to develop your mind and your way of thinking because that can be used as a gift to the world. And emotions. A woman was made different than a man in that they're other focused because of their ability to carry a child. So I think it was in... Um, I can't remember the document, Casti Canubini, maybe? One of the papal documents, they talked about how um, men see with their eyes and women see with their hearts. And so the way that, you know, oftentimes people say that men have an authority, you know, that they, you know, are good at leading and stuff, and they are. Um, they have gifts of their mind that are different than women that they're not quite so emotional. So if something happens, sometimes they can kind of cut through and be like, do this, do this, do this. You know, like um, I lean on my brothers and my dad a lot, you know, when something's difficult, like help me see through this or good priest that's, you know, help me make sense of this because I'm feeling it a little too much, you know. Um, but women, the church teaches, have authority in questions of love. Because women were given a gift to love that's it's, it's deeper, it's greater. It doesn't mean that men can't love, they can. And it doesn't mean that women can't think or guide because they can. But there's, there's special gifts that are given to femininity of love. And um, 
a woman's emotions are, it's a gift to cry. It's a gift to be able to feel compassion for another person. Um, I know in my ministry so often it's the women come up and say, you know, I want to help these kids you're helping and my husband won't let me spend the money, right? Well, what is that? That's the man being prudent and guiding the family, which isn't bad, to make sure you don't go into debt. And it's the woman feeling compassion and teaching her husband to stretch his heart in a way that maybe he wouldn't without her. So, you know, it's not you got to find a way to meet, you know, and it, and kind of discern things together. But um, you can kind of see in that an example of where men might have one gift and women another and we need each other. So your emotions are not something to hate or to, you know, be disgruntled with. Women are created to be a little bit more emotional and that's a gift for the world. Your spirit. Um, you know, the Pope has talked about it and then, um, you know, St. Paul talks about it in scripture, how that spirit, what is the spirit of a woman supposed to be like? And he kind of goes through it. And that the spirit of a woman can convert and guide and affect her husband without one word being spoken to him. You know, and you think about a woman who's full of the Holy Spirit. They can walk in a room and affect the room just by that spirit that they emanate, right? So that's an example of how your spirit can be a gift. And then your heart. And the catechism, I love the section on prayer. It's the fourth section of the catechism. And it talks about the human heart. And I, I go back to this in lots of my talks. So if you've ever listened to me, I've probably talked about it. But um, it describes what the human heart is. And it's the deepest part of a person's body, mind, emotions, you know, spirit. It's their soul. It's that secret hiding place with God. It's that deepest part of the person. It's, um, you know, where your conscience reigns. And that's the part that God wants to possess in you. And we honor Our Lady like that, her immaculate heart, right? So we're honoring purity in the heart of this woman, and the heart of her is the deepest part of her. And if something goes into the deepest part of somebody, then it kind of comes out through everything else, right? So if you can get your heart, you know, given to God, then it's going to affect the way you use your body and you think and you feel and you emanate a spirit to people, right? It affects everything else. So you kind of see here how woman was created as a gift. And I encourage you in there, go back. What is it that about you that you don't see yourself as a gift? And take it to Jesus on the cross who saw you as such a gift that he died. And he wants to recreate whatever it is that you don't like about yourself because he sees you as his beloved, you know, and ultimately Eve was made for Adam, but ultimately we all were made for Christ. And I'll talk about that in a minute, you know, um, the church was made, you know, as the wife, the bride of Christ, but we each of our souls were created for Christ, to be a gift to Christ. And then after you give everything to him, to be a gift to your husband and your children and humanity in general, right? So we see that, how woman was created as gift. And then what's the second part? Woman was given to Adam, or Eve was given to Adam, not only to be a gift, but to be a helpmate, to be, to be his helper. And the first way that a woman is a helper to man is just by her love. In today's world, people focus so much on work and efficiency and, you know, the exterior, which is great. But there is nothing that you can do better than God. Like, any great project you do, anything God in a snap of a finger can do. But the one thing he can't do is love for you. So what makes humans human? They can, that's that, like, not like animals, right? We can work, we can produce, and we can reason, and we can love. But love is the higher gift. 
right? Because God can work and do anything better than we can, but he can't love for us. So the first way that you as women are gifts in this world and helpmates are by your, it's just by your presence, by your love, by being authentically, like Father said this morning, who God created you to be. And then you're able to help, you know, other people, you're able to help men, you're able to help humanity. Now, my feminist people, you know, back at the university, <laughs> they used to get so angry about this. You talk about service, you talk about women being humble or docile, and, you know, they'd get all riled up. Oh, are women just slaves? And the one thing I always used to come back to is, you know, well, there's two things. One, in order to serve, it does not mean that you're weak. Being meek, being humble, being docile does not mean being meek or weak. You have to be so strong to actively forget yourself and make a sacrifice. Think about it. You know, think of a situation in your life where you have to sacrifice for another person, whether it be get up the 10th time with a child, although Benedict's sleeping. <laughs> But like, you know, or, um, you know, clean up another mess that one of the kids forgot to clean up or deal with a difficult coworker or something. Is it weakness that makes you humble or want to serve or is it strength? To the degree that you're strong is to the degree that you can forget about yourself. And the second thing that we must remember in our call as women to serve is that Christ is not asking anything else from us different than he asks from every Christian. Because he says, you know, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to lay down my life as a ransom for many. So Christians are called to serve. Women are given a special gift to help humanity be Christian by showing them what it means to serve. So you've got these two like very important things that we come to see in that story of Genesis when, you know, Eve is created and presented to Adam and he says, you know, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. No, it's okay. I just want to make sure you're okay. <laughs> that this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, right? Why is he so taken? It's because God gives him a gift that's completely conformed to him. And a gift that, um, you know, in a woman who has those special, that special ability to serve and to love him rightly. So it's just incredible to reflect on. There's way more in the book. So <laughs> the third gift of, or the third thing that we kind of pull from this is how women were created to be mothers. It doesn't matter if you're married, if you're not, if you're five years old or you're 25 years old or you're 75 years old. You were created to be a mom. Women were created with a gift to receive, to nurture, and to give life. That's what we were created to do. So I think about when I was three and I went to my mom, I'm totally serious. And you know, we took in foster kids and I had kind of heard about like people adopting children. And I had this brilliant idea. I begged her for Christmas to adopt me a baby. And I was a hundred percent serious. And I thought she was taking me seriously till she was joking about it with my grandma. And I was like, you are not taking me seriously. And I said to my mom, I wouldn't be a very good mom at three, but I'd be better than no mommy, <laughs> you know? And I could take care of these babies with no, no children. What does that show you though? That in the heart of a small child is that gift of motherhood. And like you see it in these poor countries, you know, with these Africans living in dirt with no toys and the little girls pick up sticks and make them into dolls. What is that? There's something in the heart of every woman 
that wants to respond to God's call to receive life, to nurture life, and to give life. Now, it's going to look different in everyone's lives, right? Some people are called to have a lot of children. I always wanted like, to get married, have 30 kids, be a missionary. My husband would die. I'd be a religious, and then I'd be a hermit. <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> that was literally my plan. <laughs> and I wasn't sure about my husband dying, but I didn't know how I could have all of this unless that happened. So I was like, <laughs> no wonder no man ever wanted to marry me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, but <laughs> there's a deal in here. But like God has fulfilled. Does that mean that I've not been a mother? Oh my goodness. My publisher laughs at me all the time and says, Mary, I've never met someone with so many spiritual children. Like, I'm like, okay, now it's Tanzania. Okay, now it's Sri Lanka. Okay, now it's Colombia. And he's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, here's a project here. Here's a project here. But God has used my motherly heart to receive his life of the Holy Spirit, to nurture life in other people, and to give life, which is to give him. Anytime you give him is giving life. Some people are going to be called to be teachers. Some people, you know, there's a jillion different ways. I mean, you can run a soup kitchen, you can, but everyone is called to receive life, to nurture life, protect life, and give life. And, and the protection of life is given to women in a special way. We have a responsibility um, because God created our bodies to protect life. And, you know, we have a call to really protect life. So when you put yourself on the line to stop an abortion somewhere, it's not even like something to get accolades about. You're just doing what you're created to do, right? You're supposed to try to protect life. And so you can see kind of how Satan has warped that in today's world, right? Where people don't want to receive life. They don't want to nurture. They don't want to protect and they don't want to give. You know, sometimes you even see moms that are like, no, it's my kids. You know what I mean? Well, you got received those kids from God for the world. Like you got to help them. Go out and be the saints that God made them to be, right? And not try to control everything all the time. Sometimes you've got to, you know, be an instrument of the Holy Spirit for your kids. So you see that identity of motherhood in every woman. And then um, wife. Every woman was created to be a wife, was created to be like Eve. But first it's to be the wife of Christ. And if you go back to those um, passages in Genesis, that wo word for woman is the same word for wife, if you go back to the original language in Hebrew. And then later on in the um, New Testament, the same thing is in the Greek. In Hebrew, it's like ashe. I don't know how to pronounce it. And in the New Testament, it's, it's gune, gunaika. And it's, it me the word for woman means wife. It's the same word. Why? What does it mean that, you know, Jesus said to his mother at the wedding at Cana, woman, you know, what is this between us? I think it's there that she turned from being just his mother to being his helpmate in his ministry, to be like the archetype for the church, which is the bride, the wife of Christ, right? That helpmate. And under the cross to the nth degree, right? Where he says, woman, wife, you know, here is your, your son to John. And we see it again in Revelation, where it says, behold the bride, the wife of the lamb. You see it when they talk about Our Lady saying, the woman clothed with the sun who stomps on the head of Satan. It's, your, it's the very femininity of Our Lady living her identity that destroys Satan. So we're all called to be wife in a way, but it's, we were created for a spousal relationship with God. You see it in the Old Testament with the Israelites and how they talk about, you know, God betrothing them as a people, as his beloved bride. It's, it's incredible to go back. And you can go to those passages. I have them in here from like Syriac and from Proverbs where it talks about a worthy wife right? In fact, it was funny. So I had like about seven minutes of silence today. You know, we were all supposed to go pray and you came through and we we're like, go be silent. So I ran upstairs 
And I was like, Jesus, I don't have time for you. Speak one word to me on this retreat. And I opened it and it was, you know, blessed is the man with a virtuous wife. And I was like, great, that means I'm doing a good job. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I see myself as his, right? Um, later on in the passage, it was like, woe to you. So I'm so glad my eyes did not fall there. <laughs> But we're all called to first be that wife, that, that woman of God, right? And to be married to him in love. And then some people, he will say, now love me through this man, through your husband, you know, or love me through this ministry or through these children. And he'll give you something. But your heart first needs to be God's. And the best place to do that is the sacraments, right? And like when you go to confession, that's not a priest, that's him. Think about like what is the one thing he's trying to speak to you in that confessional. You might have to like forget everything else the priest says if you didn't, you know, it wasn't helpful. There's always going to be one thing that he's placing in your heart. There will be. Same thing at mass with the readings. It might not be that every reading resonates with you, but it might be the Alleluia verse. It might be, you know, an image that pops in your mind. But God is communicating with you through those sacraments. And you go sit with him in front of the Eucharist and you listen to him. What is he saying? And that's that intimate moment like, think about when you're really in love with someone. Sometimes you can't even speak. Like, you, it's the deepest moments of intimacy that are in silence, that are in hiddenness, that are in that naked abandon. And that is what Jesus wants to live with you. You can find it in the Eucharist. And it might be uncomfortable at first, you know? It's uncomfortable with people you don't know sometimes just sitting or talking or getting to know them, right? But sit through it and listen to what the Lord is working within you because it's in the sacraments that you'll find your spousal relationship with him and well I'll go on to I don't remember I might have switched these two in here but one is on purity and one is on discernment but I'll say that that's um yeah I'm purity is next oops I did skip that's okay um God's call to you. Okay, discernment. So how do you know what God is asking of you? You do that exactly what I just said to you. You go to him and you spend that time with him. You fall in love with him first. And then you say, like, what is it? You're my authority. You are the man that's supposed to guide me in everything. What is it that I was created to be? Or what am I supposed to do in this situation? And he'll guide you because... He wants you to be happy, and you will only be happy when you are who God created you to be. So, like, I have to be sure I would be miserable, I mean, as all get out, if I was married compared to having Jesus as my spouse. And there are some days I get up and I'm like, I am so happy I'm alone with you right now, Lord. Like, I am so happy that I don't think I could function with that go, go, go. I need so much silence and solitude. And you know that my heart would be so messed up by somebody who mistreated me that you kept it from me. You know what I mean? Or, you know, the normal problems that come in married life. I think I'm way too sensitive for it. And, like, I see that in hindsight. Like, how he was doing what was to make me the happiest, right? There are other people who really can't navigate the world without, you know, a best friend right there at their side. And everything they do is two by two and, you know, or 14 by 14, depending on if you have a bunch of kids or, you know. And God knows what he created your heart for and he knows how to fulfill it best. And it might not even be what you think at the time always, but you got to trust him and to accept it knowing that. And, um... Yeah, and that's discernment. What that discernment is, is that listening to him. The more you fall in love with him, the more you're one with him. And the more you're one with him, the more he'll guide you, whether you know it with a voice in your head or not. You know, last night around the campfire, you guys asked, how do I know if something's from God or from me? And I, you know, I said, that's harder, you know, from God or from evil, there's discernment of spirits, right? God always gives peace and joy and light and hope and, you know, that. And Satan gives fear and confusion and anxiety and, you know, all of darkness. 
So that's easier, but it is hard, you know, with your own. How do I know if something's God's will? Well, fall in love with him. Do your best. Say, you know what? This is the darndest I can do, Lord. I think you want this. If it's not, stop me. Change the course. You know, I trust you even blind. That, you know, you are more powerful than my misdiscernment if that's what I'm doing. You know, just like I give you full reign with my life. And then you can trust him. You know, that's why it's so important to consecrate yourself to Our Lady and consecrate yourself to the Sacred Heart because you, what you're doing is giving your heart and saying to them, I give you my heart, guide it in the right direction. And then you just got to trust that he's, you know, he's going to send the people to help you in the conversations and the life situations and you know, you might be going somewhere and hit that red light, and that's actually God's way of stopping you from being on time somewhere and, and running into something, someone or some situation that wouldn't be good for you. So you want to try to discern God's will, but there's more trust than there is human knowledge always, right? You, he, he wants you to try your best and to let love guide your hearts as a lamp, as a light, let his love within you be your guide. But you got to spend time with him and fall in love with him for that to work. And that leads us to purity. Women were given a very special gift of purity. And, you know, women were, I, I like to present it this way, like call, called to be a good temptress of men to God. And to other people to tempt them to fall in love with God. The perfect example is um, Dante. And, you know, if you've read Dante, I don't know if you've read Dante, but there's a place where, um, and I think it's in Paradiso it would have been, where he meets Bea Beatrice. And he talks about meeting this woman that he is madly in love with. And he says, but her eyes were gazing somewhere. So I followed her gaze and I found God and I locked my eyes on God and she tempted him in a way to fall in love with God, right? So what you want to do is radiate that purity and holiness of God to guide people to, um, to focus on him themselves. You know, Purity is not the absence of man, but it's the presence of God. To the degree that you are full of the presence of God is the degree that you are really pure, right? And theology of the body goes into it. I go into it more in the book. Um, and John Paul II's def oopsie, definition, the microphone's going to go flowing. Um, the definition of purity and virginity. It's so beautiful how the more that your mind and your heart and your body is one and one with God, like where you're authentic, like Father talked about this morning, the more pure you are. You know, it was when the devil tempted Eve and it divided everything right? And she knew God's will, but she did something different. Everything's divided. She's divided from herself, within herself, and from God. That's where impurity came into the world. So the more that you can be full of God, the more that you can be pure and holy like Our Lady, right? It's really beautiful. And then I have a chapter here that it's been really healing for people. And I'm blown away by the responses I get, but it's on women and the cross and the Eucharist and prayer. How does, first of all, how does, how does a woman pray? How is that different than a man, you know? And they relate to God differently. You're a daughter, you're a sister, you're, you know, you're feminine in your prayer and your relationship to God. But there's no man on earth that's going to be perfect that you meet, right? Jesus was, but that's pretty much it. And so you'll probably be wounded in life, right? At times we all hurt each other. And if you're in a marriage, you're going to get hurt sometimes. You know, if you are in a family, it might be your brothers or your, even your sisters. Like we all kind of hurt each other sometimes. But our healing comes through Jesus, 
on the cross. And it talks about how a woman can find healing for everything through his love, which gave himself totally and fully on the cross to us. How he washed us in his blood, how he took our wounds onto his own body. I remember a woman um, who had major like bulimia and eating disorders, and very often that goes back to um, abuse as a child. Not always, but with her it did. It was awful, awful sexual abuse. Sometimes she was very little, and she said once, um, I was kind of translate. I was with a priest helping her, and I was translating, but also kind of helping her. So like we were all three together, and um, she said, I've talked to so many priests, no, I hate my body. I hate it. And nobody can get me to feel better about it because from the earliest age of my life, it wasn't my own. Like it was abused and stolen and all of this. And I don't even remember now if it was a priest or me who said it, but somebody said something to her about, do you hate Jesus's body? She's like, well, no. And it was look at Jesus naked on the cross. When you receive him in the Eucharist, you're receiving his body into your body. So it's not even like you're giving your body that you hate to him to make new. And however we said it resonated so powerfully with her. And she was like, I can't wait to go call my spiritual director. We've been working for like years on this and nothing's ever helped. And this got it where she could find her own identity through union with Jesus on the cross and in the Eucharist to say that his body comes into my body. His blood purifies my blood. It cha changes and transforms all of that awful stuff done to me. And now I'm getting the same reports now from overseas, from Africa and the Middle East where these women are saying, you know, we've been, you know, raped and, and tortured by these men. And we are finding healing through this, this um, idea. And it's, it's in this chapter. I, it's beyond what I wrote. I'm sure it's just the Holy Spirit. But go to that because there's great healing that can come to a person through being with Jesus on the cross and then receiving him into yourself in the Eucharist, being with him in, his, in the Eucharist. It's, um, there's a reason he didn't just say, like, take and look at me, you know? He said, take and eat. Like, he wants to be one with us. And it's where his heart and our hearts meet, and his wounds and our wounds touch, that we're healed and we're made new. He says, I make all things new. And then at the very end, I go back again and I give many examples of women saints, which you did today, which was beautiful. And uh, in fact, I thought about reading it and I was like, no, she touched on that earlier. That was awesome. <laughs> but you can, well, it was, it's awesome because you can find, like, they're all different and they do choose you. Like, I've seen that in my life and it's not even just one saint at one time. It's different saints for different needs I have. You know, sometimes I'll write it down and be like, finances, Matthew, you know. <laughs> you know, um, uh, Nigeria, St. Patrick, ironically, I don't know why, is the patron saint of Nigeria. So I'm like, my Nigerian project, Patrick. And I will make a whole list of who's in charge of what in my life. And then I'm like, okay, it's yours. <laughs> you know, my personal prayer life, you know, like who is it that I'm trying to emulate or ask to help me in that? And um, it's just really beautiful. But to find, like, these are living examples that are supposed to inspire us. And you're not supposed to be like any saint, but you're supposed to see what it is that attracts you and then have that encourage you to be who God created you to be. Because, like, we're not all supposed to be Mary Magdalene or Catherine of Siena, you know. Um, but there are things in their life that can really resonate and help you grow closer to God, right? And then I just end with that idea of Our Lady as the masterpiece of femininity. And it's so beautiful. Fulton Sheen, I, I have it at the very beginning, says that... Um, the holier a woman is, the more she becomes a woman. Because it's the more that you are conformed 
to Christ, or you imitate Our Lady who conforms you to Christ, right? Like, like why do we love Our Lady? Because she just like is the perfect twin soul of Jesus that she makes. She's the, the feminine picture of that because Jesus is a man, right? And she conforms us to him. Think about like in a family, how kids take on the mannerisms of the parents or the family. I've got a little niece that we adopted from Ethiopia. She's very much like not blood related to us. And it's funny because she's she acts like one of the Swicks. She acts like my sister's family. Like she has the same mannerisms, the same, you know, it's because like uh, they've imprinted their image on her. Well, look at that in a spiritual realm. We're supposed to be very close to Jesus and Mary so that we're just like them, right? So that when people see us, they see that kind of holiness. They're like, ah, she's from that family, right? You know, I see Our Lady in this aspect. And when you look at all the virtues of Our Lady, you might not emulate all of them. I remember a friend of mine at Notre Dame, St. Louis de Montfort, lists all the characteristics of women, or of Our Lady, and one of them was like docile. I don't know. She was like, I will never be that. <laughs> it was like docile, gentle something, I don't know. And she was kind of a firebomb. But she can be... But she can be in a different, I mean, it won't be like Our Lady, you know, maybe she's not quiet and demure, but she could imitate the core of those virtues, right? Um, she could still be gentle with people, even if she's bold. I remember a homily I heard once on bold humility in Our Lady, and it was so beautiful because she was completely docile but she was courageous. So she was filled with all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. She was bold in her humility. It only took courage and boldness to say fiat, to say yes, to be the mother of God when you weren't married and you could get stoned and killed, to take this on without even talking to Joseph about it, right? That was bold. But it's not usually the aspect of Our Lady that you think of. You think of her as like this quiet little, you know? So she has that, and she can bring out different aspects within you. So you want to go to her with your femininity. And the closer that you draw to Our Lady, the more that you'll become holy. And the holier you become, the more you'll become woman. You'll, you know, you'll grow into that, that saint that God created each of you to be. Because we were all created to be saints. I don't know how long that was, but oh, that's not bad. It was almost an hour. Good. Okay. So we're going to be done. We're going to wrap up. So, um, because that's very needy. Um, so we ask our lady to be in this room with us right now. And we ask her to place her motherly hands upon each one of your heads and each one of your hearts. And we ask her to pray over each one of you and to whisper into your ear or into your heart Whatever it is, whatever gift that she wants you to recognize you have that you might not have, know that you have, or whatever gift she wants to be giving you right now to grow in your holiness as women. We ask her intercession that this retreat does not end right now today, but that it extends into the future, that it is a living retreat and that she continues to unfold these gifts to each one of us. And we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. O sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Amen. Alleluia.